showing reverence to the Buddha and the Dharma. Showing reverence to the Dharma. When the Buddha expounded the Prajnaparamita Sutra, he arranged the Dharma seat by himself. This is very rare. It is also a symbolic representation. Since even the Buddhas show deep reverence to the sacred Dharma, ordinary beings should respect it even more. The Buddhas arise from the Dharma, so the Dharma is the cause of the Buddhas and considered as the mother of the Buddhas. The Prajnaparamita Sutra stated, At that time, the Buddha personally arranged the Dharma seat, sat straight in the cross-legged posture, and entered the supreme samadhi that encompasses all samadhis. Master Ying Guang said, The Mahayana Sutras are the mother of Buddhas, the teacher of Buddhas Atvas, the relics of the Dharmakaya of the Buddhas in the past, present and future, and the compassionate ship to liberate sentient beings in the nine realms from suffering. Even if one has attained Buddhahood, one should still revere the Dharma, to recall and repay the great kindness they have received. Therefore, as stated in the Nirvana Sutra, the Dharma is the mother of the Buddhas, from which the Buddhas arise. The Buddhas in the past, present and future all pay homage to the Dharma. How much more should ordinary beings, who are still in the early stages of practice, do so? Showing reverence to the Buddha We should contemplate the Buddha's virtues in the body, speech and mind, as well as his immense kindness in saving us, thereby generating great reverence. For example, contemplate that the Buddha, through his supernatural power in the body, radiates a brilliant light, illuminating all sentient beings and accepting them as disciples without abandoning them. Contemplate that the Buddha, through his supernatural power in the speech, expounds the Dharma skillfully liberating countless sentient beings according to their capacities. Contemplate that the Buddha, through his supernatural power in the mind, is aware of the faculties and preferences of sentient beings and imparts wonderful teachings that accord with their individual capacities. There are three aspects of contemplation, which means knowing and rejoicing in the virtues of the Buddha. First, with the supernatural power of body, the Buddha radiates a brilliant light. Second, the Buddha, with the supernatural power of speech, skillfully expounds the Dharma. This means that when he expounds the Dharma, each message can lead countless sentient beings to attain liberation according to their capacities. Beings with different capacities can understand and benefit from his teachings. How remarkable and skillful! His speech has such power and energy. The Buddha has reached a state where he can simultaneously benefit beings on different paths, whether they are on the human and heavenly path, the path to liberation, or the Buddhasattva path. When hearing the same teaching, each individual can benefit differently and attain liberation according to their own capacities. Third, the Buddha, with the supernatural power of the mind, is aware of the capacities of sentient beings. 
Therefore, a good Dharma teacher must be aware of the capacities of the audience. No matter how well you teach, if most listeners cannot understand, then it is not good. No matter how wonderful your teachings are, if the listeners don't understand, then it is not considered good. This indicates that you don't know others' capacities and preferences, and the teachings you impart don't accord with their capacities. Therefore, no matter how wonderful your teachings are, they will be ineffective. Contemplating the kindness of the Buddha means to contemplate that even encountering a single verse of the Buddha's teachings and receiving a little benefit are all the result of the Buddha's immense kindness. As stated in the Flower Ornament Sutra, in this Saha world, Vairakana Buddha, from verse generating bodhicitta till attaining buddhahood has been engaging in diligent practice without declining and has given his own body and life for countless times. China Master Yong Ming in one of his commentaries said, in order to transcribe scriptures he peeled off his own skin and extracted his own marrow. In order to propagate the Dharma, he threw himself into cliffs and fire. In order to obtain half a verse, two lines of the teachings of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, he lit a thousand lamps on his own body. In order to praise the world-honoured one, he stood on one foot for seven days. When the Buddha was practicing the Bodhisattva path, in order to transcribe scriptures, he peeled off his own skin and extracted his own marrow. In order to obtain verses such as all conditioned things are impermanent and propagate them, he threw himself into cliffs and fire. In order to seek the Dharma, He drove thousands of iron nails into his own body, and so on. In summary, the Buddha has experienced countless hardships to obtain the sublime Dharma and transmit it to us. When listening to the Dharma in the here and now, we should contemplate in the same way. What I have undergone is not only the decades in this lifetime studying from venerable teachers and diligently practicing, but also countless hardships in search of the Dharma in past lives. Today, I have selflessly transmitted the Dharma to you, and I hope that you will feel grateful and aspire to spread the Dharma to benefit more people. Therefore, we should recall and repay the immense kindness of our root teacher, thereby generating a deep reverence. Our root teacher is Shakyamuni Buddha. We are disciples of the Buddha. As Dharma teachers, we should also have the utmost gratitude towards the Buddha and our gurus. This is why every day when we dedicate the merits, we express our gratitude to the three jewels, our gurus in the Dharma lineage, as well as all the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. Revering the Dharma and the Buddha brings immeasurable merit. The Sutra of the Good Kalpa states, The boundary of the space and the depth of the ocean are measurable, but the merit of having faith in the Buddha is immeasurable. From now till attaining Buddhahood, if one wishes to completely liberate from the suffering of the lower realms and attain benefits, one should diligently cultivate virtues, avoid slacking off, and respectfully make offerings to the Buddha. 
In fact, the space is boundless. The Vinaya states, All the connections established with the Buddha, including minor acts such as recitation and offerings, will bring about happiness in the higher realms and ultimately lead to Buddhahood. The Flower Ornament Sutra states, O children of the Buddha, anyone who sees, hears or recalls the Buddha will generate great merit. This merit has inconceivable significance for them when they practice the path to enlightenment. It's important to reverently seek the Dharma. Each degree of reverence yields a corresponding degree of benefit. The more reverence one has, the greater the benefits one will attain. Thoughts and Actions with Which to Teach Thoughts Abiding in the Five Recognitions This means that the mind of the Dharma teacher should abide in the five recognitions mentioned in the Sutra, namely seeing oneself as a doctor, seeing the Dharma as an effective medicine, seeing the listeners as patients, seeing the Buddha as a teacher, and praying for the longevity of the Dharma. Moreover, one should cultivate loving kindness towards their listeners. As a Dharma teacher, one should cultivate these five recognitions, seeing oneself as a skilled doctor seeing the Dharma as an effective medicine, seeing the listeners as patients, seeing the Buddha as a teacher, and praying for the longevity of the Dharma. Eliminating Six Faults When teaching the Dharma, we should eliminate six faults. The jealousy that fears others surpassing oneself. This is the first fault. A Dharma teacher might be afraid of others surpassing themselves. Why is this listed as the first fault? Because we are most prone to committing it. A Dharma teacher might envy other teachers or practitioners, fearing that they might surpass themselves. This is the most ignorant fault. Everyone has this tendency. Chinese people tend to have strong jealousy. We need to focus on eliminating jealousy in our practice. From my observation, Chinese people tend to have strong jealousy and arrogance compared to Westerners. Although Westerners may not have the same level of wisdom and intelligence as us, their jealousy is weaker than ours. Perhaps due to the influence of Buddhism, in Chinese culture, people advocate better to be the head of a chicken than the tail of an ox. Everyone wants to be the leader, and everyone likes to be the leader. Being unwilling to see others surpassing them and reluctant to praise other Dharma teachers is also a form of jealousy, and it is very harmful. The first fault is the jealousy that fears others surpassing oneself. The laziness that delays teaching the Dharma. This means intentionally delaying giving teachings. For example, originally one had planned to give Dharma teachings today. However, due to laziness, one decided not to teach. Actually, I originally planned to go back today and give teachings, but later I didn't make it back. However, even though I didn't make it back, I still decided to give teachings here and not slack off. 
I could have just chatted with them instead of giving teachings today. However, I still chose to give teachings. This is the second fault. The weariness that arises from the physical and mental exhaustion after teaching repeatedly. This means one is unwilling to teach and dislikes teaching. Dharma teachers work very hard, but they always dedicate themselves to teaching. This is the state of not being weary in giving teachings. As a good teacher, you should be dedicated instead of half-hearted. Because if you become weary, you will become half-hearted and not want to teach anymore. When you are unwilling to do something, you will slack off and become half-hearted. Even if you do it, you will do it carelessly, lacking dedication. This is weariness. It's not easy to avoid weariness in giving teachings. You need to continuously and patiently keep teaching until the students learn and achieve it. When new students come, you need to continue giving teachings without weariness. Praising one's own merits and exposing others' faults while giving teachings. No one is perfect, and Dharma teachers are not Buddhas. If you talk about others' flaws and faults, saying things like, this Dharma teacher acts improperly in this aspect, not praising other Dharma teachers and their virtues in giving teachings, is not good, and it may be related to jealousy. We should praise Dharma teachers. Of course, the prerequisite is that they are teaching the authentic Dharma. If a Dharma teacher is teaching in accordance with the Buddha's teachings, we should rejoice and praise them. However, if someone is giving wrong teachings, we need to be careful. That's why we need to discern. It doesn't mean not exposing cults. That's not right. We should expose cults. In order to make the authentic Dharma flourish for a long time, we need to help people distinguish between what is right and what is wrong and clearly explain it. This doesn't mean talking about others' faults, but rather discussing what is right and what is wrong. As the saying goes, address the issue, not the person. If someone is giving wrong teachings, we should try to avoid mentioning their names. Instead, we should simply say what is right and what is wrong. It's enough for you to know for yourself what is right and what is wrong. As for who exactly is giving wrong teachings, we should try to avoid mentioning their names. However, for widely recognised cults and false teachings, we can mention their names. As for ordinary Dharma teachers, we should never say that a particular teacher acts improperly, as that would certainly be a grave fault. In the Brahma Jala Sutra, Buddhisattva vows, The seventh vow against praising oneself and belittling others states, A Buddhisattva should bear insults for all sentient beings, taking on negative experiences themselves and giving good experiences to others. If one spreads their own merits and conceals the merits of others, causing others to be belittled, then one has violated the Buddhisattva vows. When giving teachings, one is stingy and chooses not to give the teachings that should be shared. They are afraid of their disciples surpassing them, so they are unwilling to selflessly and wholeheartedly teach others. They still keep some teachings for themselves and don't want to share. 
this is also a fault. Having attachment to material gain. For example, if there are very few offerings, one is unwilling to give teachings. As monastics, we rely on offerings for our sustenance. It doesn't mean that we abstain from eating and drinking. We also use mobile phones, but we use them to serve others, not for ourselves. Some people might question, why do monastics use mobile phones, drive or ride? Of course we need to ride, otherwise should we walk everywhere? We use the best and most advanced tools to propagate the Dharma. They are provided by devotees and used for the benefit of everyone. We don't use the offerings for our own leisure in eating, drinking and entertainment. We are not afraid of receiving abundant offerings. However, it doesn't mean that we are dissatisfied with fewer offerings. We don't know if you have made offerings or how much you have offered. Our focus is solely on giving Dharma teachings. Everyone is welcome to come and listen to the Dharma. The door is open. We don't check at the entrance to let those who offer more sit at the front while those who offer less stand at the door or deny them entry. We don't make such distinctions here. At least, we treat people who seek the Dharma equally. In some places, major sponsors are seated in the front and served tea. However, in our Dharma Centre, major sponsors are also seated in the back and nobody knows how much they have offered. In our Dharma Centre, there are many individuals who have made significant offerings, but no one knows who they are. This yields great merit and ensures equality. Perhaps the person sitting next to you is a major sponsor, but they don't boast about it. This is better for both themselves and others. In today's temples, if someone donates something like a pillar, their name will be inscribed on it. Whenever someone visits, they will bring them to the temple and say, I donated this pillar. By inscribing their name on the item they donate, it seems to permanently belong to them. This won't yield great merit. If you support the three jewels, you will benefit yourself. This is your personal matter. Therefore, when propagating the Dharma, we should eliminate selfish motives and thoughts. If you have abilities, you can contribute your abilities. If you have money, you can contribute your money. After all, you are attaining Buddhahood for yourself, not for me. So, when teaching the Dharma, we should eliminate these faults. In summary, a Dharma teacher should reflect on their minds and strive to eliminate the above six faults that contaminate the teaching of the Dharma. If you can eliminate these faults, that would be great. You are all children of the Buddha and you need to propagate the Dharma in the future. Propagating the Dharma doesn't solely rely on me and a few monastics. In fact, propagating the Dharma doesn't necessarily require sitting on a high Dharma seat. When you share the teachings you have learned with your relatives and friends, you are also propagating the Dharma, and you too shouldn't have these faults. We should think in this way, 
the merit of teaching the Dharma in order for myself and others to attain Buddhahood is a favorable condition for my happiness. Question. Why is the merit of teaching the Dharma a favorable condition for happiness? Answer. By expounding the Dharma with a pure intention, one can attain happiness in the present, bliss in the future, and Buddhahood in the end. Moreover, those who listen to the Dharma can attain temporary and ultimate happiness. Therefore, wise individuals don't seek external conditions, that is, daily necessities such as beds and bowls, but instead propagate the Dharma with a pure intention. The attained sublime inner wealth is the genuine favorable condition for happiness. If you have attained inner peace, then no matter where you sleep, you will feel comfortable. Even if you sleep on the street, you will feel happy. This is what the favorable conditions for happiness means. No matter what you eat, you will feel tasty. No matter where you sleep, you will feel comfortable. This is the genuine favorable condition for happiness. For ordinary people, if the bedding is dirty, they cannot tolerate it. A great practitioner feels comfortable even when sleeping next to garbage bins. Conversely, if your bedding is dirty, you cannot even sleep. Great practitioners feel happy wherever they are and have no aversion to whatever they eat.